Hello, I'm Cory Hello, and welcome to another episode of Critimation, where I review animated TV shows and films. As always, I do not own any of these films or shows. They are properties of their respected owners. Our first topic is the Tiny Toons Luniversity episode, Extra So Extra. The episode begins with Hepton using a phone booth to allow students a safe place to confess their darkest secrets to. At the same time, Buster learns that he's been accepted into a mentorship, and Babs wants to put the newspaper clipping of this in her scrapbook, but learns from a raccoon living in the paper boxes that there is no school paper, and this is confirmed by both Taz and Porky Pig that they had to shut down the newspaper due to budget reasons. So Babs is forced to use her life savings in order to start a school newspaper. One of the reporters, Plucky Duck, wants to use gossip, but Babs wants to be able to inspire students, so Plucky decides to start his own rival newspaper instead. While thinking up stories for his paper, he learns that Hap tells the secrets that he's learned in his sleep, and uses this to his advantage. Plucky's paper proves to be more successful than Bab's, and the raccoon tells her that she needs a big story in order to sell. Meanwhile, Buster is getting his mentorship from not Bugs Bunny, but an obscure Looney Tunes character. Merlin the Magic Mouse. Merlin was a late addition to the franchise during the Warner Brothers Seven Arts era of the late 60s. He only had about six cartoons in total. And unlike the episode, he was a W.C. Fields impersonator. At first, Buster thinks this whole thing is a joke, but after telling Bugs about it, he is encouraged to give Merlin a chance. After seeing Merlin reveal himself to be Bugs in disguise, their lessons begin. Now dubbed Buster the Bamboozler by Merlin, he tells Helping about his experience, and Plucky uses the sleep-talking pig to his advantage once again. Once the story is published, Buster teams up with Babs and Sweetie to find out what's going on. Using Buster's newfound magic, they disguise themselves as Hampton and faculty members Dean, Granny, and Yosemite Sam of security and stage Hampton being expelled for putting secrets in the paper, making Plucky confess of what he has done. The story is then put into Babs' paper and it becomes a success. But since Babs felt sorry for Plucky, he is rehired as a writer for the newspaper. While the main plot was basically publishing a school newspaper, the main thing that stuck out to me was not just the presence of Merlin, but also how he describes tuning, which is basically cartoon physics, as a form of illusion. This line reminds me a lot about how I was taught the 12 principles of animation at my school at PNCA, the Pacific Northwest College of Arts and in my animation class taught by various teachers to whom I owe my knowledge of animation to. In animation 1 and 2 in particular taught me these principles, including timing, squash and stretch, anticipation, staging, easing in and out, arcs, exaggeration, solid drawing, appeal, secondary action, follow through and overlapping action, straight ahead, and pose to pose animation. All which were covered in the book, The Illusion of Life, by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson, two of the best animators at Disney, and members of Walt's Nine Old Men. And seeing Buster being taught by Merlin reminded me a lot of how I was mentored by my teachers to create animation for my thesis, among other things. So to all those teachers at PNCA who have taught me everything I have learned, thank you. 
I would recommend this episode to anyone who's into more obscure Looney Tune characters. Because I feel this is a great introduction to a character who probably deserved a little more credit than he's worth. His cartoons may have not been that entertaining, but he was the last line of a part of a big legacy that the studio at Warner Brothers had. Our next topic will be the DuckTales reboot episode, Astro Boyd. The episode begins with the Junior Woodchucks having a campfire with s'mores. One of them, Huey, is made fun of for overanalyzing how to make a s'more. He then meets another one of the Woodchucks named Boyd, and the two instantly relate to one another. Boyd is revealed to be a robot after he starts malfunctioning and uncontrollably shoots out laser beams from his eyes. Huey then takes Boyd to Fetton's laboratory, where it's revealed that Fetton actually helped create Boyd back in Japan when he was an intern. It is also revealed that Boyd's real name is Tubio, and he, along with Gyro, his intern Fetton, aka Gizmo Duck, and Huey, traveled to Tokyo in the hopes of preventing Boyd from malfunctioning further. Once they arrive at the old abandoned laboratory where Boyd was built, Fenton overhears a police report from his gizmo duck armor, and behind Fenton's back, go to stop the crime. During the attempt to stop them, Boyd accidentally lets one of the criminals escape, and gizmo duck has to chase after her. He then encounters the tech aide in Expector Tezuka, who reveals that Boyd had nearly destroyed Tokyo. Meanwhile, Huey and Boyd decide to tour Tokyo and see the sights. While scrapbooking their adventure, Huey nearly falls off the Tokyo Tower, but is caught by Boyd who then activates his ability to fly. Once on solid ground, Fetin and Tezuka catch up with them, along with Gyro who reveals that Boyd was the first invention he built that turned evil, and that his intention is to shut down Boyd for good. Then Boyd starts malfunctioning again, and Gyro's former employer, Dr. Okita appears and orders Boyd to destroy Tokyo. Fenton then becomes Gizmo Duck and the two fight in midair, which leads to Fenton firing several missiles which Boyd is able to dodge. A clear reference to what is known as the Indanto Circus. Huey then discovers through the footage that Fenton had shown that Akita had secretly rewrote Gyro's work to turn Boyd evil. Gyro then speaks heart to heart to Boyd, who then reverts back to good, having chose his own program and accepting himself as a robot. Akita is arrested by Tezuka. Fetin gets hired by Gyro as a full-time employee, and the heroes return to Duckbug. In case you haven't noticed by now, the whole plot of the episode was inspired by the classic anime Astro Boy. In fact, the Expector is named after the creator of Astro Boy, Ozama Tezuka, better known as the Godfather of Manga. In addition, Boyd's creator Gyro has a similar backstory to that of the in-universe creator of Astro Boy, who coincidentally looks like a rooster. Boyd's original name, Tubio, is also a reference to Astro Boy's real name, Tobio. This is, without a doubt, my favorite episode of the third season of the DuckTales reboot. Not just because it's a great tribute to the history of manga, but also because it was able to take Gyro, who was the least liked character in the reboot, and explain why he was the way he was in a very, very creative way. I would recommend this episode to anyone who's into manga and anime. And on a side note, should mention that even though it's a Disney show, it pays homage to a person who was directly inspired by the works of Walt Disney. Our 
Our last topic is the I Am Weasel episode, I Am Clichéd, which is exactly as it sounds. While Weasel and Baboon are preparing for the filming of an episode of their show, the red guy, going as Louis B. Bear, a reference to Louis B. Mayer, the co-founder of MGM Studios, informs them about the originality of the new script which Weasel is doubtful of, considering that the last episode they filmed was full of cliches. Cliches are basically a joke that we've seen a million times. And during the filming of the episode, it is chock full of them. You have anvils falling on the characters, as well as a piano, an elephant, and a whale. And yes, they include the kitchen sink. You also have wild takes, which were popularized by animator Tex Avery, as well as parodies of the Animal Fudd and Bugs Bunny cartoons, as well as Roadrunner ones. We are also given pie throwing, exploding gifts, and the ever popular babyfication of cartoon characters. Just as Weasel is about to walk out, the red guy sticks them with a hospital show, and Weasel admits he kind of likes the cliches better. While I was never a true fan of the 90s edgier cartoons, I feel like this one is worth mentioning because it was a season 4 episode, and at that point, the writers were running out of good ideas. So this was kind of a meta moment showing that they were diving into the cliché territory. I would recommend this episode to anyone who is a fan of the acknowledgement of cliches and feel this is a good introduction to some of the more classical ones that are frankly very overused but in context of this episode definitely stayed a point. Thanks for tuning in to Critimation. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And follow me on Twitter. Or support me on Patreon. I'm open to suggestions. And I will see you next time.